Good evening. You're watching The Digital Age, and I'm James Goodale. Did you know that Barack Obama is considering appointing a digital czar for his government? And according to some members in his campaign, that this will be a cabinet post? Is this a good idea? Will it work? Does it make any sense? And also, what will Obama's policies be with respect to media technology and particularly the internet? Here tonight to discuss that question for us is Jonathan Askin, who is a professor at Brooklyn Law School. He's also a member of the Technology, Media, and Internet Committee of the Obama campaign. He is, however, only here as a Obama supporter. And on my right, we welcome back Tom Lipscomb, who is a fellow at the Annenberg Center and an expert in the internet, one of the first digital warriors right at the beginning of the revolution. All right, so let's, let's uh, start by seeing how Obama talks about the digital age. So let us begin. Let us begin this hard work together. Let us transform this nation. Let us be the generation that reshapes our economy to compete in the digital age. Okay, so we've seen that Barack Obama is in the digital age. Uh, he's thinking about it. Now we want to see what he's going to do about it. Watch this. Now, you've used technology a lot in your campaign, right. YouTube channel, MySpace profile, and a lot of stuff on your own side as well. In fact, I was reading you had over 15,000 policy ideas submitted to your website from average voters across America. Uh, are any of them any good? <laughs> <laughs> Some of them are good. Uh, and you know, part of what we're trying to model in our campaign is how we're going to run our government. You know, we're going to have a chief technology officer that thinks about how to integrate technology into every aspect of what government does. Digital czar, cabinet post. Is this a good idea? I think it's a wonderful idea, although I'd be reluctant to call it a digital czar thing in relations with the well, if he's going to be Russian Empire. But if, he's go, but if he's going to be in the cabinet, uh, I mean, he's going to have mm. a lot of power, so that's why I said czar. Yeah. But why is it so wonderful? Well, I come from, I was at the Federal Communications Commission during the Clinton years. And, you know, Al Gore gets abused periodically for having claimed to have invented the Internet. I think it's a mischaracterization of what Al Gore intended to do. But bottom line is, Al Gore was given dominion over technology and government. And it meant for me, as a staff attorney at the Federal Communications Commission, that we were, it, it was a wonderful place to work. We had a mission. We felt empowered to harness new technology, to harness broadband, to harness the internet, to transform the way Americans participate both uh, among themselves and uh, in business. For the past eight years, we've been derelict in our duty to harness new technology, to harness the internet. Let me just, to can I interrupt just sure. for, for a sec? Um, because you made me think, you, when you said the past eight years, mm. could you explain that a little bit in terms of whether Bush had a, a czar? Excuse me, go ahead. Bush did not have a czar. Look, the, the way it worked, I think the president uh, uh, empowers his vice president and other people within the White House to, do, to handle certain responsibilities. Bill Clinton was very clear to make Al Gore the person, the point person, in charge of new technology. And he appointed, I think, very talented people at the FCC and empowered them to make pretty transformative changes in the way in, uh, in the ways in which people use communications tools and new technology. And it meant, and the, frankly, I think they brought the best and the brightest at the, to the FCC, to the Antitrust Division and Department of Justice, to the Federal Trade Commission, and to the various other entities in government. And there were point people within the White House itself through the um, uh, economic advisors in the White House who really oversaw the nature, the interaction between the various agencies and between government and um, uh, industry and government and the people. We haven't really seen that in the past eight years. And I think Barack Obama is dead on right when he says that he needs someone, a point person in government very close with the president's ear who can oversee the way in which uh, government agencies interact in and among themselves, the way in which government agencies interact with the people, and the way industry gets to interact uh, uh, by and between government. So a chief technology officer in some form or another, whether it's a cabinet level position or a position within uh, the Office of Management and Budget or simply an advisor to the president, but it's got to be someone with the financial resources and with the president's ear to actually be able to implement uh, positive technology and internet reform to really harness the full power of the internet for the betterment of society and for the betterment of the economy. Now Tom, we don't have any problem, I would suppose, with the statement that 
uh, if there is a person in the White House who's uh, going to coordinate various activities, as uh, Jonathan points out. But it seems to me, when you're talking about, I'm going to call him a digital czar, mm -hmm. and he's a cabinet member, we're talking more about a policymaker and someone with uh, probably more power than has been seen before, as described, particularly by John. Is it a good idea? Well, let's go back and look at one thing we haven't mentioned so far, and that is the U.S. economy as of 1997 swung to more than 50 percent of the GDP coming from digital products and services. 50 percent? 50, more than 50 percent. It's close to 60 now. Now, that's a huge swing for us not to be looking at it at a cabinet level when we're diddling around with all kinds of other cabinet positions, uh, uh, something not nearly as important to our economy as the digital area is. And furthermore, it's the growth area. It's where the small companies for small amounts of capital can pop in and do something if they don't get squashed by the big companies in the field. So keeping a fair uh, playing field for everybody is very important. And that's something the FCC did do well. But you're forgetting one thing, Jonathan. Uh, and that is there was a man named Ira Magaziner who basically <laughs> ob observed the first law of the, of the great doctor, first do no harm to the patient. And one of the things that the Clinton administration can be admired for is while having a lot of vigorous ex exploration going on, Magaziner kept them from doing dumb things like taxing the internet when it's just growing and other kinds of implications. The danger now with an Obama presidency is that all those programs that Larry Lessig and all these other guys have been dreaming up for the last eight years are now going to come crashing forward without an Ira Magaziner to be a good cop. So the question of who it is, what his background is, and how it will play out is very, very important. So uh, you're, you're favor, in favor of the concept, but who is going to be is a Democrat's And how, how you define the job. Yeah. Which okay, so I want to uh, address that question at the end of the, end of the program when we figure out uh, some of the personalities that are, that are involved particularly. But uh, do you think that it will work at a cabinet level? Well, it uh, Because it's a little different than Magaziner, who is sort of being the cop. Uh, this person's the policy, as we say in New York, maven. And uh, my question is, how does that fit with everything? Well, He's gonna well, be in everyone's business, uh, isn't uh, Well, uh, no? yes, and, and it should be, because now the digital cuts across all kinds of areas. Government systems themselves are pathetically out of date. Mm -hmm. They're dealing with seven or eight computer bases from WANGs to IBM 360s. The Museum of Science and Industry should really have half the computer equipment our government is currently using, because it's no longer really first line. So we have a bad problem in the government. Bureau of Standards has problems, all this area. That needs to be fixed. There are a lot of cooks in the stew, though. Uh, there for example, are. For example, you're a, a very learned on intelligence matters and one of the problems with the intelligence community is that their technology isn't integrated. There are database here, database there, there's a terrorist here, there's one there, and no one knows that they're both both That's around. That's true across but, the whole government. Can but, this guy coordinate get, it? But would he get into that sort of stuff? Today? I have no idea. It's how he's empowered by the president and whether whether cabinets really work anymore is another whole question you want to think now, about. Uh, as, as a practical matter, is this, is this going to work? Well, it will certainly because work better than what we've got. You describe something different, really, than what I just described with, with Tom. Oh, well, you, it's sort of a lower level position. No, no, I would love uh, if, if they can ask, uh, elevate this to a cabinet level position, I think that would be fine. It's got to be someone who has the president's ear. The issue is, and, and frankly, it's someone who has a budget. Uh, the problem is, we are existing in a government of multiple silos. The FCC is clueless about what is going on in the Department of Commerce, except to the extent that they have periodic meetings and uh, someone in the Department of Commerce might file comments at the Federal Communications Commission. Every single agency has its own website, which is completely inconsistent with the model, the format of every other website. Mm -hmm. If you, as a citizen, er, have ever tried to uh, uh, participate in, uh, in, in government, You've got a learning curve every time you go to a new government website, and you don't know who's responsible for anything. If we can develop uniformity across all of the agencies, and then on top of that, build some transparency between government and the, popu uh, and the populace, we will have done a major service to harness technology in a way that no government in the world has ever has ever done to date. All right, so that you're talking procedurally. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom is talking a little bit more, uh, I don't want to say more substantive than you, but mm. he's talking about substantive, substantive matters. But uh, I agree with that. I think yeah. I, in uh, the old days, government did the government printing office top down. Mm -hmm. You can read it, use it, do what you want, talk to your local guy. Today, it's interactive. The government needs to know what the people are reacting to in all their departments across the board. What programs are working, what aren't, other than the usual way of calling your congressman. Right. Now, now, there are broader principles, that yeah. which uh, may elevate to a cabinet yeah, level. Now I, wanted to ask, I wanted to ask you with respect to some of the broader principles. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I'm looking here at your committee, mm -hmm. and uh, you're in charge of internet regulation in this committee. That's what it says. Jonathan Askin, friends, internet regulation. A former lawyer at the FCC and Pulver.com, what tax mm -hmm. that, enterprise. But anyway, uh, I've got, there's 20 names here, mm -hmm. and each person has a different responsibility within this committee. I've never, I've never seen a committee like this in a campaign. Probably a good idea, but it's novel. What happens? You guys talk to each other? How's it working now, by the way? I, I think it's working terrifically. Like, it, it works both as a bottoms up and a, uh, a, a, a top down and a bottom up approach. Uh, we've, what was interesting to me, I got involved in the Obama campaign probably about three years ago. And I thought I was going to, you know, uh, uh, the writing was on the wall. Hillary Clinton could not possibly lose. Yeah. And I looked around the room and I noticed that every single person I respect in technology policy was already on the Obama bandwagon. Mm -hmm. That was a pretty profound revelation for me, do including anything? the old, uh, the old uh, Clinton Gore people. But do they? I mean, we, we uh, have a committee. Do they, does anything? Do they do anything? Does the does the committee's actions get given to someone in the campaign? Mm -hmm. And if so, by the way, would you know? Yeah. So let me tell you. Over the past two years, there's been an evolution in the committee structure. Uh, Barack Obama, the campaign, has I think something on the order of 15 policy committees. The technology, 15? media, telecom committee is one of 15. There's 15 policy committees. I think there's something like that. That's now, uh, unusual in a campaign. Very isn't? unusual. Usually that doesn't happen until the interim period. Yeah, yeah. well, which after, is interesting. After someone's until elected. Yeah. This is particularly interesting. You know, th in the oh. early Democratic primary debates, there were uh, Hillary Clinton was always uh, quick to say that Barack Obama was light on policy, which was astounding to me because because two years ago, if you went to any of their websites, if you went to John McCain's website and looked at his policy initiatives, you'd be lucky if you found a paragraph. If you went to Hillary Clinton's, any, any policy on or any just policy, on, any on any policy, certainly yeah. virtually nothing on technology policy, if anything at all. Hillary Clinton, you'd maybe find a page. Barack Obama's, you'd find 100 pages on each particular issue of technology. I mean, he went very deep and had his people, and layers and layers of people going very deep on technology policy. He, think about what Barack Obama has done successfully to harness the internet as a campaign outreach oh, fundraising no tool. No now, he didn't invent that. those tools. Yeah. Those tools existed four years ago. No he figured that. out a way to make them viable, or at least his technology advisors figured out a way to make that viable. And that's what they've done with the policy committees. He's got an immediate ability to tap into the collective brain power of hundreds of technology thought leaders. Every single technology thought leader I respect is easily tapped by Barack Obama and they all give their input and it trickles its way up to the uh, uh, inner circle Not of the Obama down. team. Not trickle down. It, it trickles up. Uh, and, and they've successfully figured out uh, what the best views within the, uh, the, the best minds are thinking on a particular technology. Okay, now Tom, you're a McCain supporter. You've looked at the McCain uh, technolog technology policies. Uh, because when all is said and done, it's nice to have someone who's a czar who's going to coordinate, and it's nice to have these committees who are putting up advice before the uh, person is put into office. The real question is what policy? What's going to happen with all of this? Now, as I understand it, McCain's number one policy is so-called net Neutrality is that right? No, he's against net neutrality. Oh, he's net against neutrality. net. You're for net neutrality. Net neutrality is one of the, was one of those terms like 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 civil rights. Uh, it says over the Supreme Court, equal justice under law and civil rights is special rights for certain classes that violates that principle. Net neutrality sounds wonderful. It sounds so nice and, and cushy because after all, who doesn't want a neutral net? But in effect, what it is is an attempt to uh, put and impose laws, speeds, capabilities on various providers of internet service. And the question is, which I haven't, I haven't answered yet in my own mind, is how much will this impede investment in these fields? We need more broadband. We need it, and we have lots of different ways of getting it. And I'm very much worried about the net neutrality is basically slowing down the new broadband pipes, which we need. All right, now let me, let me just take that mm -hmm. comment and ask you a question in, 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 a, in a way, as I describe, a real life uh, position in net neutrality. AT&T, mm -hmm. okay, is trying to have broadband put into the home. And for the audience, we must have lots of broadband. And the audience knows, don't you, we only have one provider, pretty much, the cable provider, although telephone companies, you can call up and get net service from the telephone mm -hmm. companies. But basically, we're looking at cable dominance. And from a broad perspective, one might think you'd like to have two people going in a home 
not just one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what AT&T did was they put a lot of money trying to build this other pipe. And the president of AT&T, whose name was Ed Whitaker, uh, said, hey, I'm building the pipe. It's my pipe. If I want to charge more for somebody who's going to use a lot of my pipe, I should be entitled to do it. The problem was, of course, uh, that if he charges more for, let's say, faster speed, that's going to use up the pipe, and the uh, person who doesn't have a lot of economic power will come second in line, and it's discriminatory. But it helps him sell the pipe. Mm -hmm. So why isn't Ed Whitaker right? Well, he's I, right if it's framed he, that way. That's not what the issue is. Oh. He's allowed to charge more for more capacity. You as a user, if you want a narrow band pipe, if you want simply uh, 64 kilobits for voice service, mm -hmm. you're paying one rate. If you want uh, you know, 100 megabits of service, you're going to pay significantly more. And no one's saying that the phone companies and the cable companies can charge more to the particular end user for wanting more capacity. What they can't do is discriminate. And they have the power right now to discriminate because they are essentially the only game in town. So they're taking that argument, and they're essentially, in my mind, this would not be the argument of the Obama campaign, I don't believe, but I think they're playing, using extortion tactics against the government and the American consumer and saying, we will Who's not... Who's they? Who's they? The, uh, the, the phone companies. To the extent that they want to build that... How are they going to discriminate? Uh, well, they've got the ability to say, uh, we prefer... Uh, this internet application over that internet application, particularly when the, the internet application is capable of delivering an identical service to what the phone company traditionally the, the provides. Way they want, the reason they want to do that is they'll make more money that way. They'll make more money right. that way, but okay. they should not be able to parlay their but, monopoly control to make more money. Okay, but the point, the, the point is that if they can make more money by manipulating the broadband, mm -hmm. why isn't that a good idea if we need to have the second broadband, which needs the money to make it competitive with the cable. Well, look, we certainly need at least a second pipe. Frankly, we it's probably not need How will it get built? It, it, look, it's got to get built. The, the economics compel the Bell companies to deploy more and more fiber. If they hope to, look, the cable companies for the past eight years have been eating their lunch because they've got the coaxial cable network and are capable of providing two-way broadband. John, Jonathan's absolutely right about this. Let's look at all that dead cable that were, or fiber optics that was left in the ground once we solved the twisted pair problem years ago. All of a sudden, huge billions of dollars of cable was dark, that the, the twisted, the, that is say, the fiber optics. This is making it possible to go back and pick up on that already invested and amortized loss, turn it into a profit. Huge incentives for the telephone companies to make this last mile connection go through. That's true. Let's look at what's also happened. We've dropped from being about third most broadband in the nation to what? In the, world. the world to about th 15th or We're about 22 or 23. All right, so we've, our competitive advantage in what we've already agreed is a digital economy and a digital world has fallen way off under whatever the policies have been in the last 10 years, I'd say. It's more than just, just this, this administration. A dynamic approach to getting more broadband is tremendously important to our economy. Well, if, okay. there, therefore, that's why McCain uh, is against net neutrality. That's correct, okay, because so, he sees so it slowing down investment. Yeah, so, so, so basically, when all is said and done, and we look at the committees, we look at the czar, we're going to have basic policy choices to be made, and to be a simpleton about it, mm -hmm. uh, McCain is pro-business, and Obama's anti-business, isn't he? No, he's absolutely not. Look, what, what is he pro? He's pro inter in new internet applications, the ability for consumers to have a multiplicity of internet delivered options. And that can only be delivered over broadband pipes. So everyone wants robust broadband pipes. They have different mechanisms to get there. 2000. 1999, both George Bush and Al Gore, and then in 2003, both George Bush and John Kerry proposed uh, uh, broadband plans, uh, universal broadband policies, an effort to make sure that the same way even, uh, the poorest among us, the most uh, rural, remote among us, have access to phone service. The, both campaigns had plans to build out broadband networks ubiquitously to all Americans because they thought that was the way uh, you create the network effects and the ability, if more, if more and more people in even the most remote areas are on broadband networks, it increases the productivity value The problem value is it hasn't worked. Okay. Yeah, that's, well, that's well, what it hasn't I'm, worked because that's what I'm trying, no, that's no, what no, it hasn't there's no money there. It hasn't worked for another reason. Government has its own little ways of dealing with pipes. Let's look at the, at, at the number of axles you have when you pay your toll on the Jersey Turnpike. Here's an attempt by government to decide how to use traffic and how to be compensated for its cost and how to make a profit. Everybody does this. 
there's been a lot of absolutism on both the right and left on this issue, and I think that's complicated our moving forward, because the, the left wing is saying, in effect, we want the lowest user to have exactly the same rights as someone who can pay a lot more money and put a lot more traffic through that. That doesn't make a lot of sense. On the other hand, the right wing is saying, in effect, we don't want government to have anything to do with this at all, while it looks like a public utility to everyone else. So uh, it, having is whether you have a czar or you don't have a czar, these issues have to be fought out in an area with authority to get a proper policy through so we go from 22nd back up to maybe 10th. Yeah, no, uh, <laughs> would you say... And even that data point yeah, is misleading. Would, would you say you're far left on this? Not generally speaking, but on your, your approach as a committee member for Obama. Like uh, am I, f you mean, do, am I more of an advocate of a pure uh, open access yeah, net right, neutrality right. position in the campaign? I may be a little bit more. now. I believe that there, we, what we've got to do is actually sit together across industry sectors with government to create the mutually virtuous cycle. Because think about broadband oh. without interesting internet applications. That's useless. Those are right. empty pipes that mean nothing. So do you want to allow the phone companies complete oversight over what can be done with those pipes without any incentive on the part of internet application providers to build interesting, compelling internet applications and know that those applications are going to be able to reach end users without an intervening gatekeeper? Well, we've already got them. But Things like BitTorrent brings the whole thing to its knees, and now we've got 15-year-olds posting Facebook videos. Think about I what mean, BitTorrent brings things to I, its knees. I, I, well, I, tell, I tell, tell the audience what it is yeah. first. Uh, BitTorrent is a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing network that allows, that harnesses the global computer, uh, the, the entire uh, uh, computer network in the world to allow computers to perform some of the processing power that were traditionally performed on central servers. So it, it, think about Napster. Napster. A lot of people say Napster was a bad thing. Personally, I don't think Napster was a bad thing. I think it was just harnessed improperly and before its time. It brought a new technology that threatened existing revenue streams for existing music companies and existing uh, uh, film companies. What it, but what it did, now, is, what it did is make possible large-scale theft through the internet, and I don't think anybody on right or left wants that to continue. So to you happen. deal with the theft issue. But okay, Torrent and okay, Napster are both used for legitimate okay, purposes. Okay, let me just now. see if I can put the right-left mm -hmm. uh, into context. And I, by the way, I don't consider this a right-left issue. We've got free market Republicans well, who support net neutrality. Right as well. It's only happened over the past four years or so that it's become a Republican-Democrat divide okay, as members of Congress have fought for uh, 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 PAC money contributions but, from the various but, but sides. How do you, you said earlier that the Internet czar, a term you don't like, uh, would sit down and go across the table and work things out. Or will the Internet czar make the Democratic policy, which is maybe more left than Tom, you know, on its own and then jam this through uh, Congress. I mean, how do you? No, I mean, this is the question about what the is the Internet Czar going to make this kind of policy? I'm convinced the Internet Czar has to interface with industry, with citizens, and with well, the government agencies. Well, if he makes a policy, then he's a big deal. He's I mean, this, making policy, on this but in, in, on this in, issue. in discussions with the industry, you've got in. So this is an interesting distinction that I, I felt between the Clinton years and the Bush years within the FCC. What I found really interesting about the Clinton years was their ability to float trial balloons with industry representatives. The FCC today is a very closed, secretive place. I don't know if this has been your experience, Tom. Uh, it, it, it's pretty difficult. And yeah. For example, when they were out surfacing the issue on, on net neutrality last fall, those weren't really open hearings that they had. It was a put-up job. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So I, I'll go along with him on that. Uh, all right. Point. I want to turn let this. Me, let me come, I want to come back to another point. It's important. Uh, 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 okay, but you can do your point. I'm, we've got to get in the question: Who's going to be the Who's going to be the czar? And some of the names. Well, let's floated. come back to that. First okay, of all, fine. why is this broadband so important? One reason is the largest product we have in this country for the world marketplace is intellectual property. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, if you think of what, how much money Time Warner makes off its cable service and other outfits make off their cable service, we're making a fortune out of this area of IP. We lack the kind of pipelines to move it into the national market properly or the international market properly. So we're still sitting here with silly prices being asked for individual tunes on, on whether it's uh, a Apple or any others. The prices are too high, but there's no not enough volume so you can play with it. I think there'll be a burst of economic activity and high profitability coming when we do get our broadband access properly specified mm -hmm. and at the right level for our society. All right, let's, let's talk about who's going to be the czar. Garrett Graff who writes for the Washington Post, written a book, highly acclaimed, has said that the czar is going to be Larry Lessig. Mm -hmm. Now, Larry Lessig uh, is an expert on digital matters, but he's also a person who does not believe in 
property rights the way they have been articulated in the past as they uh, pertain to people who own copyrights. Mm -hmm. So without trying to throw too much smudge on it, uh, he's viewed as uh, being far left, I would think. Larry Lessig, what do you say? Well, somebody who doesn't believe in property rights is a Marxist, right? Well, no, I think that's he's that's not far left. left. He's, 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 a Mar he's a Marxist. So uh, wait a minute. I said someone who p says he's not interested in property rights is, is Marxist in his thinking. Larry Lessig is a very shrewd guy and has given a great deal of contribution to the whole field of cyber law. The area in which I think he's, he may be being an agile provocateur here, the area in which he we have to deal is basically should the uh, te uh, telecommunication, excuse me, now the Copyright Act that came through, what, 10 years or so ago, yeah. mm -hmm. which was a sellout of the American people. Copyright is supposed to give a guy the right to get royalties for a certain amount of time, then it goes into public domain for the American people. That last Copyright Act was passed so Mickey Mouse could live into an afterlife that still rewarded Walt Disney and company. So if Larry wants to say, look, with crap like that going on, I want to go back and look at, in a digital world, how we should have property rights and how they should be extended, and if the czar wants to deal with that, that'd be a very good thing. Yeah. As a political matter, yeah, you would like to have Larry Lessig in there? I'd like to know more about what Larry Lessig's plan is. I, As I a don't political know. matter. Would you like to have Larry Lessig in there? Let me just. I think he'd be wonderful. I do not think he's a Marxist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I think that's a, a, a real mischaracterization of where he stands on intellectual I property. I said one policy. If you're in okay, favor of free private, free, yeah. freeing private property, it's a Marxist policy. Do you disagree with that? Look, the primary point Did that. Do you disagree with that point that I made? Is that a Marxist policy? If you, in fact, uh, believe in the redistribution of property and put it under government control, I would say that was well, clearly a Marxist what, that's position. That's how he presented it to me. That is not what Larry Lessig believes. And I don't want to pre presume to speak for Larry Lessig or other people on the you know, either the copy left or the Creative Commons side of the divide. Mm -hmm. Creative Commons was an effort. Learned Creative Lessig Commons is something that Lessig started. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's a much broader You're community now. Finish up as we're it's primarily to the end. a recognition that the laws, the copyright laws that were written for an analog world, do not work effectively in a digital world. We've got new means of distribution, digital distribution, and we've got to deal with the fraud issues. We've got to deal with the ability, uh, the fact that China gets to uh, 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 you know, uh, copy 9 out of 10 DVDs. Uh, produced in America, and we don't see any of that revenue. But let's deal head on with that. Okay, we've issue. come to an end. Okay, should we have a digital czar, and should it be Larry Lessig? Uh, I believe we need to have a point person with the president's ear and the budget to harness new technology and the internet for the betterment of uh, the American people, and to allow for transparency, to allow citizens to participate with government. That's I think Lessig would be a wonderful. Oh, I think go. Lessig would be a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, point person okay. on the issue. Thank you very much for coming by, Jonathan Askin. Thank you. Same question to you, Tom Lipscomb. Should we have a digital czar and should it be Larry Lessig? I'm open to being a digital czar, and if I knew more, I'd be open to Larry Lessig. He's well, quite a brilliant man. I, don't, I think government will create enough friction so he won't have his, his, that particular issue all the way to the wall. Thank you very much for coming by, Tom Pleasure. Lipscomb. <laughs> and thank you all for coming by, and come by next week and learn more about the digital age. For the digital age, I am. James Goodale, good night and have a good week.